Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Great CEO Podcast. Today, I have with me another great CEO, um, Dan Izaki from United Safety Technology. Um, welcome, Dan. Welcome. Nice to meet you. Uh, very nice to meet you as well. So, Dan, um, in a few words, in a few sentences, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and your company? Sure. Um, so I'm the CEO and founder of uh, United Safety Technologies. We are a company that uh, stood up at the beginning of the pandemic to um, to uh, reshore the the, um, the manufacturing of uh, of uh, critical medical supplies. So we started okay. uh, we started manufacturing N95 respirators, uh, and currently we uh, are in the process of building a factory to produce uh, nitrile exam gloves. Okay, um, and we took over um, the uh, old Bethlehem steel mill uh, outside of Baltimore, Sparrows Point. Uh, to do that. So we're sort of breathing uh, new life into uh, an old facility that was uh, at one point responsible for uh, pumping out all the steel that went into all the ships that helped us win World War II. Yep. Um, and, um, you know, we're we're repurposing that facility to join the, the, uh, the fight against, uh, you know, bio, uh, bio weapons and, um, and safety. So it's real exciting. No, that's great. Hey, um, thank you very much for doing what you're doing. Um, I remember like it was yesterday, all the shortages that were abound and how hard it was um, to get um, supplies like that. So kudos for taking advantage of A, taking advantage of that business opportunity and B, um, helping out a major um, cause, you know, for, during the pandemic. So congratulations. Thank so I, um, I've heard about, you know, several other companies that do, you know, similar things. A lot of people also, you know, took advantage of this opportunity that was presented. So what would you say United Safety Technologies um, competitive advantages in this market? Um, well, you know, I think that um, a number of the companies that, uh, that stood up, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say necessarily it was, you know, taking advantage. It was really identifying a problem and solving that problem. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, the bigger, you know, we like to solve big problems. And sure. um, once we discovered, uh, once I personally discovered that, um, you know, that the domestic manufacturing of critical PPE was not here. I thought to myself, that doesn't make sense. I mean, why wouldn't you want it to be here? And um, and there were a number of other companies sort of with the same same frame, you know, same mindset uh, that all started to um, that all started to um, to attack the problem from different different ways and different directions. Um, I think what we did, uh, which which was interesting, was I sort of went into my you know, just went into sort of the, the idea of, okay, well, currently this industry doesn't really exist domestically, but it does exist somewhere. So where right. does it exist, right? So, um, you know, we did it, we did a global search for, um, you know, where, where it exists. Um, and then, um, and then went and looked at those companies that were doing it at the highest levels. Um, and then, you know, instead of reinventing the wheel, figured out how to model what they were doing successfully. Um, and I think one of the, you know, one of the critical, uh, pieces that differentiates us from a lot is our team. We have a, a really strong team that, um, that's been in the, in the glove manufacturing, uh, space okay. for many, many, many years. Um, so we already, you know, we, we sort of have that, that collective, uh, you know, that collective knowledge of what sure. needs to be done. Um, and I think, um, you know, that's what really differentiates us from, from others in, in the space. Awesome. Um, sounds, sounds like there's some really great um, brain power um, behind the corporation, which is great. Yeah. So from a um, growth perspective, what would you say your biggest constraint is that like, if you can remove it, you'd be able to grow a lot faster? Like what's one big constraint so, you have? So, so, there's a, so I think at the highest level, right? Anyone that's manufacturing a uh, product in the United States would realize that, uh, you know, it's very expensive to manufacture products here compared sure. to compared to Southeast Asia, compared to, to um, other, other regions of the world. And what, you know, the biggest problem that, that, that I see is the, is the sort of, um, you know, the collective amnesia uh, in the healthcare space, uh, forgetting all of the lessons learned during pandemic, uh, during the pandemic, when um, everyone was, you know, scrambling to get gloves and masks and gowns and respirators uh, and other products because of the supply chain disruption due to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I think that, I think that, um, you know, the biggest problem or the biggest limiter limitation to growth is really the fact that we're, you know, we're, we're sort of being, uh, compared against, uh, 
product coming in from China, for instance, which is currently uh, being sold at a, you know, I don't want to say dumping because I, I, I can't technically substantiate the, that accusation, but, uh, you know, they're selling product into the United States uh, in gloves, for instance, significantly lower than what it probably costs to manufacture. Okay. Uh, certainly, certainly much less than it costs to manufacture domestically, but also much less than it probably costs to manufacture in, um, in, in Southeast Asia as well. Um, so I think that the pricing pressure um, when we're being compared to um, to domestic or to uh, imports is probably the largest, um, you know, the largest barrier to, to some of our growth, because uh, although there are, you know, we are fortunate to deal with a, a number of forward thinking uh, supply chain leaders uh, at big organizations, the, the, you know, they're more in the minority than the majority. So right. hopefully, um, hopefully we'll see some changes, um, you know, with a whole, whole of government approach to, um, to, 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 to looking at critical industries such as ours and figuring out how we can level the playing field. Um, uh, you know, and that I think will help once that, le- once that playing field uh, gets leveled, sure. um, I think that'll really be a significant uh, driver to 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 growth for for our company and for our industry as well. Yep, I, I think I think so as well. So, um, how much of your revenue would you say is recurring revenue? Like, do you, um how, do you sign long term contracts with the um the folks that you supply your products to? Yeah. So so typically, um, you know, typically, uh, you know, we would enter into long term contracts uh, just because. Uh, we need to understand what our, you know, what our production schedules are going to look like. Um, so a lot of it is a lot of it is recurring. Um, okay. You know, hospitals know how many gloves they use year over year. Sure. Uh, you know, the big distributors know. You know, they know what the demand is going to be within a fairly tight range. So based on those numbers, they're able to predict out what they'll need. Um, you know, what they'll need for the next, you know, X period of time. Um, some of the contracts, uh, you know, we would enter into would be shorter term and some of them the long term, longer term, obviously, uh, you know, longer term is better for us because we can, um, you know, we can sort of count on that revenue. Uh, but, you know, we are able to respond to, to short term, uh, shorter term uh, opportunities as well. Okay, interesting, interesting. So from a work week perspective, you know, a lot of CEOs are always curious, you know, how many hours others in, in their role, you know, put in. How many hours would you say you work a week and how do you allocate your time? So I would say I work 24 hours a day, 365 uh, <laughs> hours, uh, 365 days a year. Um, you know, I don't, um, you know, when you're, when you're, when you run a business, um, you know, they're, they're, you know, the definition of work, you know, I think, I can't remember who said, you know, if you like, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. I, I love that. Um, saying. Yeah. And it's so true because I, you know, 100%. I'm, you know, I start my day, you know, I start my day at, uh, at about 4.30 a.m. Um, and, um, you know, and I'll work as long as I have to work. And, and um, you know, and that could also, you know, just be, you know, meditating and, 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 and having thinking time to think through some, sure. some problems or solutions, right? It doesn't necessarily mean I'm, you know, breaking piles of rocks or moving things from one, <laughs> you know, shelf to another, right? Yep. Work, you know, work, work is a, you know, work, work is, um, you know, and there are some people who, you know, who have every, you know, every five minutes of their calendar blocked and, you know, they, you know, they're, they're, they're very, very, I'm not, that's not what I do. I mean, I have a list of things that I, that I want to achieve uh, throughout yep. the course of the day. Um, and I, you know, and I prioritize and, um, and, and try and get those done. Um, I think the biggest challenge is not, you know, is to sort of, uh, you know, not waste time. Yep. Um but sometimes, you know, in wasting time, that's when you sort of learn and develop. So it's hard. It's hard to tell. Nope. I, I totally understand. I totally understand. So for, also from a time perspective, I know delegation is key. It's uh, really, really important in order to really achieve um, what you want to achieve from a you know goal setting perspective. Um, what is like our one or two major responsibilities as a CEO that you've recently delegated to others? Um, so, you know. You know, I know what I'm good at and I know what I'm not good at. And the good news is that the things that I'm not good at, there are people out there that are really good at it. Yep. Uh, so, so for instance, you know, I may not be the greatest detail person, right? So, you know, so I have a COO who is only a detail person mm-hmm. and, um, you know, and I, and I rely on them, for instance, to, 
to handle all of the, you know, all the operational issues of the company. Um, right. You know, we have a very strong CFO who manages, you know, all the financial, you know, aspects of it. And, um, you know, and, 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 you know, going from a, you know, I don't want to say solopreneur, entrepreneur, but sort of running smaller businesses to now running a much bigger business. Um, you know, I had to start to realize that, you know, uh, you know, I'm not depositing checks anymore. I'm not, you know, I'm not sending out demand letters. I'm not running to FedEx. I'm not, you know, it's not a really good use of my time. I'm not, you know, yeah. I'm not worried, you know, I'm not, you know, I, we, so we, in other words, you know, now that we have that infrastructure and that, you know, and obviously and you need to be, the confidence needs to be built, right. Sure. To the point where, you know, you feel comfortable, um, you know, where you feel comfortable, not, not necessarily letting go, but you feel comfortable that, um, that the person that you're delegating to is going to make good decisions. And that needs to be, that trust needs to be built over time. Sure. And, um, you know, and I think we're at that point now where, um, you know, where, where I think what, one of our, one of our, our previous, uh, 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 employee said that his goal was to become a dad. I said, what do you mean you want to become a dad? You're almost a granddad. He goes, no, nope, I want to delegate and disappear. <laughs> and um, yeah. And that, you know, and that, you know, and that gives, uh, and that gives me time to, you know, not being involved in all the, de- all the details that I don't necessarily need to be, or not, I may not necessarily be adding the most amount of value. And um, I can, I can think about other things like strategic, uh, you know, strate- more things that are strategic and where the company could go. And, you know, as, as Gretzky used to say, you know, the reason for his greatness is because he liked to skate to where the puck is going to be and not where it is. So, you know, always looking for the next thing, uh, trying to understand how we, uh, how we, uh, you know, grow the business and get into new businesses and develop and expand, whether it's different regions of the world or different product categories. Um, so, um, so I think that that's really probably in the area of operations is where, where um, I've sort of delegated the, the most. Sure. So it sounds like you've surrounded yourself with it with a very capable executive team, which is fantastic. So that's you know central to a lot of you know CEOs' roles, just surrounding themselves with the right people. Um, would you? Is there anything else you'd like to call out? You know that's you know central to your CEO role that you'd like others to know about? Yeah. You know, I would like. You know, I would like to. You know, one of the things that you know that I gra- you know that I grappled with. Uh, you know, originally. Uh, when when starting the business and, and 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 the business started doing well was you know well you know I don't know if I'm qualified to be the CEO right you know there's smarter people in the world I'm definitely not the smartest guy in the room I never want to be the smartest guy in the room so if you're the smartest guy in the room you're in the wrong room I think right but um but you know you know but the reality of it is you know when you know when you when you know if you if you have a, a growth mindset and you want to continue to continue to grow. Um, you know, I think you can grow in and step into that role um, because it's not like there's a, a college of CEOs or, you know, you know, an MBA and CEO, right? You don't, you don't get that, right? It's really just mm-hmm. about, about, um, about who you are and, and, and your ability or your desire to, to grow, learn and listen. Um, and obviously, you know, f- figuring out how to surround yourself with, with the right people. Um, I think that's what, you know, so what I would say is, um, you know, don't believe, don't believe the, the the voices in your head. Sometimes, some people need to. Sometimes need to listen to to, to other voices outside their head, right? Hundred percent. But a lot, of, a lot of times, um, you know, the, I don't know what it's called, the imposter syndrome, where you know you say, yep. you know, I, you know, a lot of people say, you know, I'm going to be discovered for, you know, for the fraud or fake at any moment. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm hearing that more and more lately. It's being used all over the place. Imposter syndrome. It it makes sense. Yeah. So that's that's the only thing I would add. Okay, got it. Got it. So it sounds like um, you have um, your qu- plate quite full from a work perspective. I know that you're working on at least one other pet project, but uh, you can feel free to talk about that as well as like, what else would you, what, what do you do for fun when you're not working? Um, well, you know, I'll say the trite, you know, spend time with family because that's kind of true. Mm-hmm, of course. Um, I, but I think that, um, you know, I, I really enjoy smoking cigars and being left alone. I think that's my, <laughs> that's, as I, as I get older, I think that's my, uh, you know, that's, that's, uh, you know, it's probably one of the things that, uh, that bring me, uh, bring me a lot of, uh, you know, some, some peace and, and, nice. and uh, and, uh, calmness. But, um, I think, uh, you know, in terms of other pet, pro- I wouldn't call it a pet project, but one of the things that we identified when, you know, when starting, when I start, you know, when I started this business and uh, kind of connected with uh, a number of other similar like-minded people was that we all, we all had uh, needs uh, that were beyond the sort of, um, 
you know, we, we needed we needed uh, support and we needed the government to hear us, for instance, what we were doing, what our challenges were. Mm-hmm. And um, realize that, you know, we, you know, 30 individual companies could, you know, reach out to the different stakeholders, at, you know, whether it's a Department of Defense or HHS or the administration, uh, you know, to reach out individually and, and hopefully get some time and, and, and speak, you know, say what we say what we need to say. But, you know, in, in talking to all, you know, a lot of these people, I, you know, some of us were in different, similar businesses, but slightly different, different geographical regions. And, you know, we ha- we all had some independent ind- individual needs, but there were also a number of collective needs that we needed. Like, sure. for instance, you know, dealing with, uh, you know, price dumping from from Asia, um, you know, government agencies, prefer- you know, preferencing made in America product. I mean, these type of things were, you know, affected the whole the whole industry. So one of the things that uh, we did was we got together and we formed the America Me- American Medical Manufacturers Association, which is a, okay. an industry group uh, or coalition of domestic manufacturers of medical product and devices, um, and really, um, you know, built that. And it's really a, a separate company, if you will, that needs to be managed and grown and has employees, uh, has messaging, ma- marketing, um, government advocacy, advocacy. Uh, and that's something that I'm I'm very proud of, um, th- you know, that we that we were able to find uh, a bunch of like-minded um, stakeholders uh, that were willing to invest their time and money uh, or the company's time and money uh, into helping this industry grow and be sustainable, so that during the next pandemic we have a domestic source um, of critical medical supplies uh, versus having to rely on, uh, on overseas. Uh, That's great. Uh, it must be really companies. rewarding being part of something that not only helps your company, but just helps the industry as a whole. Right. And that goes back to the solving bigger problems, right? So, sure. you know, you know, this is, a, you know, supply chain resiliency is a fairly, um, you know, uh, biosecurity. These are two very, very big problems that, um, you know, that we're looking to, to solve. And uh, it is it is it is rewarding sometimes uh, you know sometimes challenging and frustrating, especially when dealing with uh, different agencies within the government. But uh, you know, fortunately, there are people involved that are more patient than me that deal with it uh, on a day to day basis. Awesome. Well, um, wish you continued success with that, and um, also with United Safety Technology. Um, Dan, thank you very much for joining me today, and um, that wraps up this episode of the Great CEO Podcast. Thanks, Dan. Great. Thank you. I enjoyed it.